Hi everybody, welcome to episode 32 of the Pins and Needles podcast. My name is Zoe, you can find me on Ravelry and Instagram as Pins and Needles UK. We do have a Ravelry group as well, which I will link to down below. And if you want to get in touch, do send me a direct message through Ravelry or Instagram, or you can email me at highpinsandneedles at gmail.com. Welcome back. Welcome back. Thank you for spending some more time with me this week. Um, and hello to some new viewers. I've had quite a quite a few new bugs in the last few days, so welcome. Um, first of all, I wanted to say thank you very much. I've had so many lovely comments on my kids from the last episode. <laughs> I'm never really sure how much people are going to be interested um, in my family. Um, obviously, I don't want to put too much out there, but the knitted objects were so much tied up with them um, and the lovely uh, bags that Leslie sent us and Jocelyn did want to come on and say thank you. So thank you for the lovely comments. I'm glad you enjoyed seeing them. I don't know what the chances are of me getting my eldest son on this podcast ever. He does love knitted things, so maybe one day he'll come on. We'll see. Anyway, I passed on all your compliments and the kids were absolutely thrilled. So thank you very much for that. Um, the first bit of news, I just wanted to keep you updated about the knitting retreat that I'm organising with Jenny of Owl About Yarn. I have my official mug, it's called the Knit Tea Retreat. Um, we've got um, an Instagram uh, for the retreat as well, so do find us on there, we are at the Knit Tea Retreat. Um, and we've started revealing the tutors. So last time I told you that we had Annick and Alice, and our most recent tutor reveal is that we have the lovely Jen Best of Beaker Buttons coming to do some workshops at our knitting retreat. Have you heard of Dorset Buttons? You might well not have done, particularly if you are not in the UK. Um, it's a very traditional British craft um, of making decorative buttons. Um, they are you know, functioning buttons if you want them to be, but there's a million different things that you can do with them. And Jen of Beaker Buttons had a wonderful stall at Wonderwall this year that Jenny and I were selling at. So we happened across her stall and we both bought a kit. Um, and when we decided to go ahead with the retreat, she was top of our list to come and be a tutor. So we've done some teaser pictures on Instagram this week and Jenny sent out a newsletter to our email subscribers as well. So if you're interested in being the first to hear about things, sign up to the retreat email account. And I will show you, for those of you that don't know what beaker buttons are, this is what they are. So you, uh, Jen has a website, it's beakerbutton.co.uk and she sells kits, this is the one that I found, and this is a mixed pack. And you, can you see that they all have different central designs? So what you get in a pack is these brass rings and some yarn, and she also includes a darning needle, and a really good instruction pack. And basically you, um, you use the needle and the yarn to form a ring around your brass ring, and then you weave different designs into the center using the instructions. Um, so as you can see, I bought a kit but have not yet made it. <laughs> anyway, it's a lovely little um, a lovely little craft, and as well as making buttons, um, Jen also does jewelry, beautiful necklaces, um, and as I said, you can make a set for a cardigan. I know Kate Davis has used Dorset buttons on some of her designs. Um, but they're also just nice decorative things. If you have a hat with a tab on it, you can just have a little dorset button for decoration. I think Jen has a sock pattern where she has a tab coming over the cuff and a really nice um, design and you can do beaded ones and all sorts. So yes, our second tutor for the Knit Tea Retreat is Jen of beakerbuttons.co.uk. So we're thrilled. We've got two more tutors to reveal. So do come and follow us on the Instagram account um, all the details will be down below, which reminds me, all the details for everything will be down below in the drop down box. Um, and I do also put show notes up in the Ravelry group, so you can head over there as well if you want other details. In terms of um, general news, my kids have finally gone back to school. Yay! <laughs> it was a really long six weeks, really long six weeks. 
um, and Jocelyn was going up to secondary school. So she was very excited, a little bit nervous. But she's taken to it really, really well. My eldest son is at the same school, so he took his um, big brother responsibilities very seriously. So he was really kind, making sure she knew where to get the bus. And um, they have, um, all the students at this particular school have an iPad mini. And a lot of their textbooks are on there. They use Google Classroom a lot. Homework is done on there. So he was helping her get that set up and things. So, so that was really nice to see. Um, and Jocelyn's been doing amazingly well, getting herself up in the mornings. We all have to be up at sort of 6.15, so that's a bit of a... I mean, I'm an early bird, but the kids aren't so much. Anyway, so back to school. That's all looking fantastic. Um, my youngest son, Max, that you met last episode, he's going into his last year of primary school. Um, and he went off on his school trip. They always take them away for a few days team building, outdoor activities and things like that. And that's why he needed his jumper and his owl. Um, this last week has been a bit of a humdinger. The um, car started flashing warning lights everywhere. And we only have one car. And where we live and where we work is about a 40 minute drive, depending on traffic. Um, you can, the train service is also brilliant, but we work shifts. So one or the other of us is in at, you know, between 6.30 and 7 in the morning and we can be working till 9 o'clock at night. So you can get the train, but it makes for an incredibly long day on top of a 12-hour shift. So I've been having car shenanigans and um, Jocelyn had a day off sick. So really this whole week just, I've got nothing done, nothing done. <laughs> it's just been one endless... Um, panic attack of logistics and cars and children and shifts. So um, I got through it with rather a lot of help from my friends. Um, but I'm glad it's Friday. I'm recording on Friday. I think it's the 14th of September today. Dave's at work. Kids are at school. I've walked the dog. Bliss. The house is quiet. So I'm going to take full advantage. I'm going to record this podcast. I've got a bit of work to do. Um, and then when the dinner's done and the kids are all in bed, I'm going to knit. Okay, I'm going to head straight into pins, which is my sewing section. And the lovely Demelza is modelling my finished object. Now, I showed you this last week. Um, I think I managed to get it cut out last week, but I managed to get it sewn up. This is the Blackwood Cardigan by Helen's Closet. Um... Helen's Closet Patterns. She's on Instagram as Helen's Closet and she has her own website and blog. And as you can see, it's a, I made this version. Um, and it's a jersey open fronted cardigan pattern. It's not supposed to close at the front. Um, and the pattern is wonderfully well written, really clear, um, really nice line drawings, super easy make. Um, I didn't make any modifications whatsoever. Now, those of you who have been watching for a while will know I'm very tall. I'm six foot one. So I have to modify absolutely everything. Um, but I follow Beth of So DIY on Instagram. And she's an Australian lady. She's five foot 11. And she started an Instagram hashtag, which is hashtag sewing tall. Excuse me. And she, yeah, she made the Blackwood cardigan and said that she didn't have to make any modifications whatsoever. So neither did I. And although this cardigan is supposed to be mid-thigh length, um, on me it came comfortably just longer than my bum. And the sleeves are supposed to have a wrinkle um, at the cuff. And I had a slight wrinkle, not a full slouch. So I didn't even need to lengthen the, the sleeves. Um, I made it in this textured navy jersey dressmaking fabric, which I bought from MinervaCrafts.com. Bought that a while ago, actually. It's been in stash for a while. It was pretty cheap, and they sent me some matching thread as well. So I had pretty much no problems whatsoever sewing this up. Um, if I, the only thing I would say is that my fabric is all synthetic. I'm assuming it's a polyester. So 
it doesn't really press very well. Um, so I haven't got the crispest edge on the collar pieces or anything like that. So, but it's fine. It, it, it's a casual cardigan. It works very well. But you would get a crisper finish, I think, with a different, a different fabric. So there you are. You can just see that there's a texture in this. And can you see that there is also, there we go, you can see that there's lines in the pattern. This made cutting it out straight super easy. I was really pleased. Um, and it also made matching things up, like getting the pockets in the right place, super easy. So it has a standard cuff, which I managed to match pretty well. It has a long um, front band, which you attach and then top stitch down. I used zigzag stitch for this. I didn't bother using my serger. And I bought a standard reel of thread. I think it was 100 metres and I ran out <laughs> because it's so long. I had to go and get extra thread. Um, so, yeah, it's I mean, there isn't a huge amount to say about this. Um, as I said, it came together very quickly, very easily. Um, I really enjoyed making it. I did. Let me show you the pockets. So. Mm -mm. Here's my pockets. Now this top bit is a double thickness of fabric, which you then attach to a single thickness of fabric. And when it comes to attaching it, can you see how the fabric bulges slightly by there? That's just because there were so many layers of fabric going my through my machine. And I don't know, it didn't say in the pattern to trim the seams down at any point. Maybe I should have done that. Um, and again, at the bottom corner, can you see it just sort of splays out a bit? It's not quite in a straight line. It, it doesn't bother me at all. It doesn't show up particularly. And these pockets are quite low because of the length of the cardigan. But I also managed to match the stripes. It's looking a bit wonky because of how I'm holding it, but they're pretty matched. And I used the, the sides of the pockets matched up to the dots in the fabric as well. So it all came out wonderfully well. So I'm thrilled. I think this is a pattern that I will make um, again and again. I'd quite like to get like a wool, a wool knit fabric in this. And because it's got cuff bands and a neck band that goes all the way up and round and a deep bottom band as well. My arms aren't long enough to hold this up. There you are. The bottom band adds about four inches of length. You could have tons of fun with scraps. If you had scrap jersey fabric, you could do contrast bands and, and all sorts. Um, so I was really pleased. When it came to choosing the right size, um, because it's open fronted, I decided that the most important measurements would be this, my, my back distance. So this measurement, a bit at the back, um, and my upper arm circumference. So I measured myself and then compared it to the pattern piece sizes. I didn't use the measurements on the pattern. I actually measured the pattern pieces themselves. Thank you to everyone that suggested doing that. And it fits beautifully across the shoulders. Really nice. The line falls nicely down my front. But the arms are too small. <sighs> they are so small as to make it completely unwearable. It's supposed to be a close fitting pattern. I think she suggests half an inch of positive ease. And these are skin tight. So maybe I forgot to take the seam allowance off my measurements when I measured the pattern pieces. Um, but it's really not, it's not wearable. I wanted to be able to have this to wear over other things, t-shirts, and there's just not a chance. So I've done a beautiful job of making a cardigan I love that I can't wear. I'm a bit cross really. I so enjoyed making it and it's such a lovely pattern it's entirely my fault but after the short disaster about which we will not speak um, I was really hoping that this one would be a success so I will see if it fits Jocelyn or maybe my mum and somebody else will have a nice cardigan but that somebody will not be me which is a bit of a shame. I think to be honest the problem is with me obviously and not the pattern um, I do a lot of weight training, so I have got muscular arms. 
So the good news is I can bench press 50 kilograms. The bad news is I can't wear my cardigan. So you win some, you lose some, I suppose. So I was a bit cheesed off about my cardigan. And um, I think I've pretty much had it with garment making for the moment. I need a break. I'm fed up of spending lots of time on things and ending up with an unwearable garment. It's not a waste of fabric because I'm sure I can find somebody who would like it, but it really feels like a waste of fabric and I, I hate that. So I decided that my next sewing project is going to be something where fit is completely unimportant. Now, I don't know um, if any of you have heard of hashtag SewPhotoHop. This is a September monthly photo challenge organized by Rachel of At House of Pinero. I'll put the links below. And it's basically a daily prompt um, for a photograph to put up on your Instagram feed. And some of it's about you or about your favourite make or what you're most proud of, spots or stripes, things like that, essential bits of kit. Um, but one of my favourites is the sewing space photo prompt. So if you search for hashtag sewphotohop, you can go through the, the feed on Instagram. And I always enjoy looking at where people get to sew. Um, I did put a picture of my sewing space up if you're interested. It's very uninspiring, quite shabby and a bit of a mess. Um, as I've said before, I share the back room with um, an Xbox. <laughs> so it's a bit of a multi-purpose space. Anyway, so I was looking at everybody's lovely um, sewing spaces and thinking that mine was a bit grotty. And I was sort of pinching different ideas. Um, and one of the things that I spotted was well, somebody had sewn a lovely um, rectangular quilted mat for underneath their sewing machine. Quite a lot of us have to move our machines in and out of place. So I've got um, a sewing machine and I've got a serger. So when I'm sewing up the garment, um, I push my machine to the back of the table and then I pin whatever I need to pin and then I pull the machine forwards again and do the sewing and then I push it to one side so I can cut a bit of fabric out. So I'm moving this thing around quite a lot um, and I don't have a particularly heavy machine but you, it's still not ideal to be pushing and pulling and shoving. And I thought, well, if it was on a mat, that would be much easier. Um, I do sometimes put my machine on a folded tea towel, partly to just make it a bit quieter and again, it is easier to, to move it around. But yeah, whoever it was that had this picture had a really nice quilted mat and I thought, I'm going to have a go at that because if I make a pig's ear of it it's going to be hidden by my sewing machine so why not have a go and it's not a case that it the mat is never going to fit it's just squares so I had to dig around in my box of stash and I had um, a pack of fat quarters that I bought ages ago I don't know how long I've had them um, I bought them just from Hobbycraft, which is um, our British chain crafting store. It's a bit rubbish, but it's better than nothing. Mm -mm -mm. Trying to work out how to hold these so I can show you. So that was my pack of fat quarters. So I like greens and blues and purples, so that's what I bought. Um, and at some point I'll get round to decorating my craft room how I want, but for the moment... I haven't picked a colour scheme, I just liked these. So I chose these two um, to be my squares. And I've got some old, um, have you ever been to Ikea and seen they've got those super cheap fleece blankets? They're about three pounds in the UK. Um, and they've got sort of a scalloped edge. It's decent quality fleece. So I thought, well, I could use that for the wadding um, and then one of the other fat quarters to be the backing and I could make some bias binding or just buy some cheaply off eBay. So that was my plan. Now I've never quilted anything, I know nothing about it. So I had a look in my Reader's Digest um, book of sewing, I can't remember the title, um, and that had a couple of suggestions. And then I hopped online and I found myself I think this is called an Ohio star, correct me if I'm wrong, like that. And I thought, well, that's 
squares and triangles, surely I can manage that. And you can see it's got the instructions of how many of each sort to cut out and how to sew them together. Um, so I've got um, my grandma's old quilting ruler. It's an omni grid with all the diagonals on it. Um, and I've got a rotary cutter and I've got a mat. So I sat down to cut these out and I've done it wrong. And it says cut four three and a half inch squares. Now, if you don't know what you're doing, and I say cut a three and a half inch square, you're going to measure three and a half inches that way and three and a half inches that way and cut out a square, which is what I did. And then when I was trying to rearrange them to look like this to check it before I sewed anything, it the multicolored ones weren't the same size as the plain ones when you put them together, and I thought, well. What's, what's the matter with that? I think, I think that when they talk about quilting, three and a half inches doesn't mean that way and that way. It means diagonally from corner to corner. So I made a mess of that as well. So I don't know if I'm gonna do this now. <laughs> I might just sew the triangles together and call it quits because um, I'm not going to lie, I'm feeling a bit fed up about my sewing. You try and you try and then you keep mucking it up. But I'll stick with it, I'll have a go. I won't be defeated. I just won't end up with quite what I planned on having. But anyway, there we go. The other good tip I was given um, was I've only got a normal plate on my sewing machine and the seams need to be quarter of an inch, which is very close. Um, and someone suggested getting a different plate for my machine that doesn't have such a large gap under the needle, but I, I don't want to invest in that at the moment. Um, so I was told I could put tape. Um, I've got some washi tape, so it's not terribly sticky. So I could put tape over the large hole in my plate and just make a hole for the needle itself to go through. And then hopefully the fabric won't get pulled down into the feed dogs. So I've got plenty of scraps to try. I've got a quilting needle for when I need to do quilting. I've got thread. So we'll see. It's not going according to plan, <laughs> but then that's just the way my sewing is going at the moment. So I will let you know how I get on with that. On to needles, my knitting bit. I've had a bit more success here, thank goodness, <laughs> to keep the spirits up. I've got a couple of finished objects. The first is the owl that I knitted for Max. He had a Weasley jumper, which I showed you last time, and he also wanted a headwig to take with him on his school trip, and so I sewed him one. One of the ends has popped out on his face, so you'll have to excuse that. I need to give that a snip. So this is the obligatory owl pattern by Sarah Elizabeth Kellner. It's a free pattern on Ravelry. Um, I knitted it in Aran weight yarn. It's Hayfield Bonus Aran, which is a 70-30 acrylic wool blend. As you can see, it's a tweed version, which worked out rather nicely. It's knit all in one piece. Um, I did it on double pointed needles. And you um, knit the body in the round. You can see the shaping here. So it gives his, his chest a good shape. Um, and then you pick up stitches around here for the head. You knit the head in the round up to a certain point and then this triangular head bit you just knit back and forth on the head stitches and then decrease to form a point and then you just fold it over like that and sew it down. Now in the pattern they have a different body, they have different colours for the body and the wings and this part of the head but because it's a snowy owl I did it all the same. And then you knit um, the wings separately and sew them on. You form this ridge in the head by when you sew that top flap down, you deliberately pinch more stitches than you need and it gives you this nice line effect. A bit of sock scraps for his beak and some brass, they're not showing up terribly well, brass button eyes. And then his little feet, I must admit I didn't do the best job of these. Um, again, just some scraps of iron that I knitted a hat out of. So Max um, was going on his school trip on the Monday and I had forgotten that he wanted me to knit him an owl. So I worked 10 till four on the Sunday and then I came home um, and by the time I'd got the kids to bed and I had time to sit down and knit, it was 8.30 at night. 
If you need to know how long this takes to knit, the answer is about five hours. <laughs> so I started knitting at 8.30. I put Lewis, um, do you know Inspector Morse, the TV series that done um, after the actor John Thor died, the series continued with Kevin Watley as Inspector Lewis. Anyway, I put Inspector Lewis on the television for a marathon and I started knitting at 8.30 and by 1 a.m. Oh, I had done everything except the legs. 1 a.m. Oh my God, I was actually feeling sick by that point. Um, and then the next, that night I went to bed, yeah, about half past one in the morning and we had um, a, a storm come through. So the wind and the rain was unbelievable. Um, and my bedroom was at the front of the house and with the rain lashing against the window one night, I didn't get any sleep. And then I was up at half past five the next morning to get Dave off to work. And then I had to finish the legs and stitch those on, um, get two of the children out of the door by 7.30 for the school bus, and they'd forgotten to cover some of their books. So I was panic covering books, making breakfast, making lunches and making legs. And then Max had to be at the school for 7.45 to catch his bus. So this owl nearly killed me, but um, he absolutely loved it. Um, he really enjoyed having it with him on the school trip, although he did say some of his friends thought it might have been a penguin. I'm not going to mention any names. Definitely not a penguin. Anyway, so yes, obligatory owl pattern. Uh, Sarah Elizabeth Kellner. Yeah, you can tell it's a bit of a rush job. His legs are coming a bit loose as well. So I'll have to go back and do some first aid, I think. Um, my other finished object is still slightly damp. Um, I was knitting the sock head cowl pattern, another free pattern on Ravelry. I'm sure you've heard of the sock head hat. Same lady, Kelly McClure, but a cowl. And all you do is you cast on some ribbing and then you knit a load and then you do another load of ribbing and you cast off. Now this lovely yarn is Ladybug Fibre Company. And there's the yarn. It's part of a yarn club and it came with a mini. And I finished the cowl. Look at that. You can see how long it is. Completely covers my face. Um, so I got it washed yesterday and blocked. I haven't pinned it out, I just laid it flat to dry. But with the Welsh weather, it hasn't actually finished. Now this is a merino cashmere nylon blend. It's the first I've ever first time I've ever knitted with cashmere, and it really is gorgeous. It feels so super soft. Um, and it's been perfect train knitting, absolutely perfect. The ribbing isn't quite the same. I'm not sure if I'll be able to show you. I haven't quite got the ribbing the same length. So that's where the ribbing is on one end and that's where the ribbing is on the other. So I've got about three quarters of an inch difference. It says in the pattern to knit four inches and then weigh your yarn so that you know how much you need to knit the four inches at the other end. So I did weigh my yarn, but I think, well, obviously I, I didn't get it right. It doesn't matter. You, by the time you've put this on and it's all scrunched up, you're not going to tell. And I only had um, that much yarn left. So I might have been able to get one more row of rib out of it, but I didn't want to risk it. Um, so yeah, super easy. I think this is going to make a lovely warm cowl for the windy, wet weather in Wales. Perfect commuter knitting. And, you know, so many of us have beautiful indie dyed yarn and we just want to make the most of it. And you really can't beat just plain stocking stitch for enjoying the yarn. I mean, look at that. I love the coral colour and purple is my favourite. So once I've uh, finished podcasting, this is going to go back outside and uh, dry off. It smells nice too. I have some apple flavoured shampoo that I save for blocking my knits. So it smells of apples. Um, on to works in progress. Um, in my lovely bag by Nelly Welly, I love this. She sent this to me for free, bless her. She sponsored our newfangled make-along in January. 
by sending a bag to give away. And she said, this one for me and I love it. So I have started knitting the um, first pattern in the Selbu Mitten Club, which is a four month pattern club by Ellie of the Scandia Knits podcast. Oh, sorry, I've got lemon squash in that. And it just got the back of my jaws. <laughs> anyway, Selby Mitten Club by Ellie of Skane Deer Knits podcast on YouTube. Um, oh, I'm in a tangle. Hang on a second. So this is four DK weight mitten patterns. And she'll be releasing one a month from September. Um, and this is how far I've got. So up to here is the cuff. You just have sort of two, two rows of rib at the bottom. Up to there is the cuff. And then this is the start of the um, pattern for the hand. And there's the back. And you can see here, this is the edge of the mitten. And this bit here between these two stitch markers is the thumb increases. And I've got a little um, progress keeper that Jenny made me just so I know that which is my front needle. When I, I don't like having markers on my needles if I'm doing magic loop, I worry I'm going to lose them. So I just mark the side of the fabric that I know is the front. Um, the, she, Ellie of Skained In It's always says, check your tension, your needle, check your own gauge to work out what needle size you need. So she does give you some recommended needle sizes, um, but I found that with my tension, it was coming out too tight. So I've gone up a couple of needle sizes. I'm knitting this on four millimeter needles. These are my Knit Pro Novas um, and I'm doing it magic loop, but on quite a short needle, as you can see. The yarns I am using, the cream is Sirdar Balmoral DK and that's 72% wool, 25% alpaca and 3% silk. 125 meters in 50 grams. Now this is a Serdar yarn that's discontinued. You can see I've got it on clearance from Hobbycraft. Um, and I think they're coming up a nice high contrast there. Now Ellie goes into a great deal of detail about yarn selection for these mittens. And she recommends um, in the pattern and on the details bit of the pattern page on Ravelry, several um, Scandinavian yarns that you can use and if you go to the Skane Deer Knits Ravelry group there's a thread I think it's sticky thread at the top that lists various suppliers of recommended Scandinavian yarns both in this country and in Europe where you can order from and um, I wanted to use stash yarn for these so the meterage per 100 grams is perfect on these yarns so it's the right weight of yarn and um, the green is 100% merino that's king I wrote it down king coal merino blend dk I've lost the ball band I'm afraid I don't know the colorway but it's a nice green um, and as I said the cream does have a bit of alpaca in it and a touch of silk but it's 72% wool so it's fine she does suggest a rustic toothy yarn and these are not but it's working up absolutely fine um I need to double check the pattern because when I cast these on I was so tired I could hardly see straight um, so you knit the cuff and obviously the, the repeat is the same all the way around so obviously doing magic loop I had half the stitches on the front needle and I had half on the back and then I started knitting the palm and I the thumb placement was peculiar when I've knit mittens before, if you're doing a gusset, if you're doing gusset increases for a thumb, it's always at the side of, of your needles. So one side for the left and the other side for the right. Um, or you're going to do, um, I don't know what they call it, like an afterthought thumb where you knit in a few rows of scrap yarn and then you later come back, pick the waste yarn out and knit the thumb. So rather than it being on the side, you actually you knit it here but this seemed to have a thumb with gusset increases but the gusset increases were in the middle and I'm thinking well that seems odd and like I said I do need to double check 
but it seemed to me that rather than having palm, palm <laughs> and back of hand stitches on front and back needles and knitting back and front and back and front, you had half the palm and half the front of your hand on one needle and the same on the other. So you weren't going back and forth like this, you were going back and forth like that. Now, I don't particularly enjoy Magic Loop. I know perfectly well how to do it, but I do get some slight tension issues. So if I show you on the cuff, this is where my needles join. And can you see there's a slight ridge? So when I was knitting the cuff, I was thinking, if you ignore this top bit, this will be one side of the hand and that will be the other. So any differences in my tension will be at the side of my hand and I won't notice. And then when I started knitting the main bit, I realised that I wasn't knitting back and front. I was knitting here to there and back again like this, which meant that my mitten would have sat like that. And then I get that ridge that was going to go right up the front of my blooming mitten. So I rearranged my stitches um, so that I've got a front and a back. And as you can see, that's the very edge of the mitten. I've got one edge there and there's the other edge there. And there is my thumb gusset between the two markers. So that confused me because I can't show you the chart because it is a paid for pattern. But the mitten chart looks very standard. You've got one mitten chart like this with a little bit for the thumb and then you've got the other thing like this but you don't have the stitches arranged in an intuitive way. And I maybe that's a traditional way of knitting Selby mittens, but it was driving me spare. So I rearranged the stitches on the needle. I got a big red pen and I drew a line right up the middle of the chart. Well, it, the point is it wasn't in the middle. I drew a line on the chart so I knew where my front and my back was. Um, so I don't know. If anyone else is knitting these, have I read it wrong? Is that a traditional way of knitting Selby mittens? I don't know. What I will say is that um, they were coming up a bit small. I know a few other people um, have said theirs was coming up a bit tight as well. It's 100% wool, so it will block. And if they don't fit me, they will totally fit someone else. <laughs> um, when I knitted my mum some colourwork mittens for Christmas, I was worried about them as well. So I made myself some DIY mitten blockers um, I bought a one pound placemat from Ikea, it's very thin plastic, I, well I drew around a friend's hand because I've got very large hands, I basically I drew around my hand, um, I didn't do the thumb, and then I, rather than having bumps for my fingers on the blocker, I just, I think they, hers was, my mum's had a rounded top, so I just sort of made a rounded top, these are going to be a pointy top, so I'd make myself some with a triangle top like that. Um, and I'm sure that um, that they'll block out absolutely fine. So yes, I'm going to knit these. I'm really enjoying knitting it. Now I've got all those details ironed out and um, DK weight, they're a really nice quick knit. So I would really love to get the pair finished by the end of the month in time for the next pair to come out. And I think I will knit those in red and black because those are the school colours for Conrad and Jocelyn. And Jocelyn could do with some winter mittens. So I'll knit her some school winter mittens. So yeah, there's my Selby mittens. Very much enjoying my colour work. Um, my other works in progress, I'm afraid I can't share with you because they are secret design projects. So you're just going to have to wait. Oh, lemon squash. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, yes, they're secret design projects. So you're just going to have to wait until those are finished. I think the last little bit of info for you is that next weekend, no, not next weekend, the weekend of the 23rd and 24th of September, I'm going to be at Yarndale. Yay! <laughs> Yarndale is one of the biggest um, knitting shows on the UK calendar. Um, it's up in Yorkshire and I have never been, so I'm very excited to go. It's um, shows in the UK are either quite fancy posh ones or they are a bit more agricultural and the agricultural ones are my favourite. 
Wonderwall Wales, which is my favourite show ever, is agricultural, and so is Yarndale. So there are going to be actual sheep for you to have a look at. Um, it's, it's apparently enormous. I've had a good look through the list of vendors and quite a few people that I know from Ravelry are going to be there as well. So I'm very excited. Jenny and I are going up on the Friday because it's about a four and a half hour drive. And um, we found a little Airbnb place. We'll be there for the whole weekend. Um, I will be meeting up with some of my friends when we get there. Um, we haven't decided on times or locations or anything. But if you're interested in coming and saying hello, please do. The best thing about these events is getting to meet people. So keep an eye on my Instagram feed and I will put up on there where and when um, I will be around for meeting. I think all the other things I have to say is um, if you enjoyed the video, please give me a thumbs up and click subscribe. Check down below for the um, details of everything I've talked about and I'll put the timestamps down there as well. Make sure you follow the Knit Tea Retreat on Instagram for the next tutor reveal. And that's it. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you in two weeks time. Bye.